It's a Tuesday. We're coming on the air. A telling split screen from President Biden and Vladimir Putin laying out their opposing visions of the world as we near now the one year point since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ahead, we are live in Warsaw and in Moscow, breaking down the next phase of the war. Plus, stocks are tumbling today after two of the country's biggest retail chains said that they're concerned that high costs will keep consumers from spending. And guess what? But it all comes back down to those interest rate concerns. And think about how much snow there has to be in Minnesota for it to be historic. We're on the ground in Minneapolis, where the good people there are preparing for potentially life-threatening conditions yet again. We're also on the ground in Ohio, where the EPA chief says Norfolk Southern has got to clean up all of its mess and pay for it, too. But that is not tamping down a sense of fear and distrust in the local communities there. We're on the scene and we're on the story. And Congressman George Santos admits he's a liar. A terrible one, too. Now, those are his words, not mine. Why Santos says he never thought he'd get caught. That's coming up later in the show. Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Halle. And with President Biden preparing to head back home, the message he delivered to Ukraine, Russia and the world today is that the U.S. is not going anywhere. It was a dramatic speech in front of a mega stadium sized crowd in Poland to mark one year since Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Here's the president using a remarkable platform outside a castle in Warsaw. The White House says 30,000 people were there waving American, Ukrainian and Polish flags. The president did not mince words on his outlook for the war and the man he says is to blame. Brutality will never grind down the will of the free and Ukraine. Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. Yeah, the president's speech hits at a critical time with the one year anniversary of the invasion fast approaching and with the Russian attacks unrelenting again today in Kherson, six civilians dead, at least 12 injured and a Russian strike on a bus station. So let's lay out who the speech was really meant for. Biden is trying to place this war in a larger narrative for people in the U.S. and in Europe, showing them that it matters and the stakes are high. In fact, he says polls are, in fact, critical. They show support is starting to waver. As part of that, the president calling for new sanctions. That's a challenge given that, A, he has a Republican-led House that is skeptical of the war, and B, sanctions have not yet slowed down Vladimir Putin. At the same time, President Biden is vowing to, quote, defend every inch of NATO territory if it comes to that. But Biden is also trying to speak directly to the Russian people, telling them that Putin is lying to them. President Putin's craven lust for land and power will fail. The West was not plotting to attack Russia, as Putin said today. This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. President Putin chose this war. We will get the view from Moscow in a moment, but let's start in Poland with NBC's Josh Letterman. Uh, Josh, uh, the big theme the president wanted to get across here, this is an ideological battle, and in his words, there is no sweeter word than freedom, right? That's right, Tom. He must have used that word about a dozen times in his speech today at the Grand Royal Palace Gardens, just a few blocks from where I'm standing. The president saying that the appetite of autocrats cannot uh, be appeased. It must be stopped. And he really delivered what amounted to a split screen rebuke of Vladimir Putin of Russia, who was giving his own speech earlier in the day, doubling down on this war in Ukraine. But President Biden trying to cast this as part of a broader fight between autocracies and democracies, making clear that he believes this continued support for Ukraine in the second year of the war will be critical to making sure that autocrats like Putin and others, namely China, uh, will know that the West is not going to put up uh, with countries thinking that they can violate other nations' uh, territorial integrity or take territory by force. You know, Josh, you had the celebratory vibe in Poland today with songs from Diana Ross, from Coldplay, from Twisted Sister playing. But underneath all of that, there are real challenges to the president's facing, th that he is facing rather, to try to keep up the morale, the support for Ukraine. Talk us through that right now. 
Yeah, on the one hand, you have folks here in Europe who want even more support, who think the West has not done nearly enough. And there were protesters outside of the event where President Biden was speaking today, holding up signs uh, calling for F-16s to be sent. Uh, you can see some of them on your screen right there. They want fighter jets to be sent to Ukraine. But the flip side of that is there are a continuing concerns that as this war drags on with no end in sight, that some of that support is going to wane. There are those Republicans back at home who are balking, some of them about continued U.S. military assistance uh, to Ukraine. And there are nations, even within the coalition here in Europe, that are more forward-leaning about wanting to urge the Ukrainians to move quickly into negotiations, to find some diplomatic resolution to this so that Europe doesn't have to be dealing with this war in the long term. But President Biden trying to hold this coalition together, believing, according to White House officials, that the best prospect for ending this is to get the most leverage possible for Ukraine by strengthening its hand on the battlefield. Josh, I want to play one more soundbite from the president because it fits into the bigger picture of his message. Take a listen. Let us move forward with faith and conviction and with an abiding commitment to be allies, not of darkness, but of light, not of oppression, but of liberation, not of captivity, but yes, of freedom. Our colleague John Allen is pointing out that Mr. Biden has used that line before at the 2020 Democratic National Convention. Is this a preview of the president's broader campaign, his message maybe, as he prepares to announce his own 2024 run? It certainly had that feel as he delivered that speech here today in a country, Tom, where 82 percent of the population approves of President Biden's handling of global affairs. That is like 40 percentage points higher than his approval rating back in the United States. Uh, and as President Biden uh, was discussing some of those themes about democracy versus autocracy, they're the same themes that he has used to describe uh, former President Trump and the battle uh, between uh, some of those domestic political forces. And one last point on that, the fact that as President Biden is being questioned by some Republicans back at home, like Nikki Haley, questioning if there should be, you know, tests for people who are over 75 to run for office. Here he was. He did this incredible trip to Kiev that involved flying in the middle of the night from Washington and a 10 hour train ride into Kiev, 10 hours back. Something would be difficult for pretty much anybody to pull off. Yeah, he is 80 years old, and he seems to have held up pretty well. Josh Letterman, thank you very much. Wall Street has suffered its worst day of 2023 with red across the board. The Dow, the S&P, the Nasdaq, all down more than 2%. Why? In large part, it's because of alarm bells from two of the country's biggest retail stores. Walmart is warning it might be in for a rough year, worried that inflation is going to take a big bite out of consumer spending. Home Depot was saying the same after posting weak fourth quarter numbers, and that sent the stock tumbling down 6% today. CNBC's Ron Insano, my old colleague, joins me now. Ron, those Home Depot, Depot numbers are, are concerned because the store is kind of seen as a bellwether, right, for the broader economy. And we have this new report showing weaker home sales as well. Yeah, to the extent, Tom, that consumers are, are focused more on buying basic necessities, groceries and the like, and inflation is, is, is cutting into their income to do that. Uh, we also have concerns that inflation is going to remain sticky, and that set interest rates up sharply, which put a lot of downward pressure on the stock market. As you said, worst day of the year, the Dow down nearly 700 points. The Nasdaq down two and a half percent. So it was a route across the board based on concerns about the consumer, but also on worries that the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates too much and drive yeah. us ultimately into a recession. Ron, it seems like today's warning is really a sign that traders believe the Fed will continue hiking rates. It's already done so eight times. And yet this unemployment rate remains unbelievably low at a 1916 line nine low. It's almost a story of two separate economies here. And in, in a sense, you're right, Tom. I mean, part of the problem that we have in the employment market, the labor market, is we're literally short people. We have 1.9 open jobs for every unemployed American in the U.S. So we are short laborers. It's, it's not that the economy is growing so fast, growing at about a 2.5% clip right now. It's that we're literally short people. And, and no one's certain that higher interest rates will solve that problem in any meaningful way. 
By the way, you and I are also short people, but I get your point. Ron, yes. thank you very much. Ron and Sana, thanks so much. Now to the U.S. Supreme Court, which seems skeptical today about a big case against tech giant Google in a lawsuit that has the potential to reshape the Internet as we know it. Justices heard arguments about whether Google can be held legally responsible for ISIS-related content that appeared on YouTube, which Google owns. Content that one family says led to their daughter's death in the 2015 Paris terror attack. A second case tomorrow against Twitter focuses on how that play platform may have also contributed to terrorism. And this matters because of a legal shield that sites like Google and Twitter are relying on and they enjoy. If somebody on social media falsely accuses you of something, you can sue whoever posted that. You cannot sue the platform. And that is thanks to Section 230. But what the Supreme Court decides here has the potential to dramatically limit how much these platforms let us interact on the Internet. NBC's Yamis Alcindor joins us now to talk more about that. All right, what do we hear in oral, oral arguments today about the family's case, the Gonzalez family's case against Google? Well, Tom, as you said, this is a huge case. It's the most possibly the most consequential case to come before the Supreme Court on Internet governance in our lifetime. And what you see here really is the Gonzalez family arguing that YouTube and Google, because this is Gonzalez v. Google, because Google owns YouTube, mm -hmm. that they should be held liable for not just the content, but the algorithm that recommends videos to people. Meaning if you're someone who clicked and you wanted to watch an ISIS video, then YouTube says, well, how don't you watch the next one and the next one? The family is saying that act that re recommending is the the problem here. The justices, both conservative and liberal, they seemed on the same page in that they were very, very skeptical. Listen to Alega Kagan, who's saying, ah, maybe this isn't the right place for this. Take a listen. We're a court. We really don't know about these things. You know, these are not like the nine greatest experts on the internet. You are creating a world of lawsuits. So what you heard there really was deep confusion, Tom, from these justices who are saying, we don't really understand if we're the best place to legally decide what an algorithm is, especially if it's an algorithm that's doing the same thing for cat videos mm. as it's doing for terrorist videos. So bottom line, what would the Internet look like without this protection, this 230 protection? Well, this case, of course, is centered on Section 230, this federal law. It was passed in 1996 in the early, early, early days of the Internet. And essentially, if this goes away, you're going to see you're going to see sites like YouTube, like Facebook, like Twitter. Twitter, essentially be, has it, be be told you could be liable for the user-generated content, meaning that if somebody goes on your website and writes something that's liable or writes something that's dangerous, you can not just sue that person, you can now sue mm. Google. Um, so that might mean that these sites will say, you know what, we don't want to come with comment sections. We don't want to have user-generated videos. This would change the internet as we know it completely. That being said, these justices did not seem like they were poised to do that. That doesn't mean, of course, in the end that they might not come to that conclusion, but it will have lasting impact if they do, in fact, find that the Gonzalez family is right in this case. I mean, to be clear, we're talking about more than an ISIS video, which is terribly disturbing. We're also talking about just free speech, and you could even be talking about news reporting on the Internet. Certainly. That's the, that is also at the heart of this. You have, and I think it's really interesting when you bring that up, because at the early days of the Internet, what you had was the, the, the government and the American people really saying, these are platforms. We see them as platforms. We're not going to hold them liable. We don't believe that if someone said something bad at AOL at the time, that it's going to be AOL's problem. But you've now seen a change in that. You've seen Twitter and Facebook. You've seen people say, well, actually, Twitter and Facebook are the problem. They should be doing more to moderate election denying or, or misinformation. So we've really seen a change mm -hmm. in the way that people think about the internet, but I don't know that that means that the Supreme Court is going to be the way that this changes, but it is really interesting to see that that sort of shift has happened, and that could, in fact, change the way that we see the internet. Sign of the Times. All right, Yamish, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Minnesota's Twin Cities are preparing for a potentially historic storm. Yeah, we get it. It's Minnesota. It's February. But this one could be the biggest snowstorm in 12 years, possibly bringing more than two feet of snow. It's part of a major coast-to-coast -coast storm, putting 42 million people under winter alerts. Parts of states in the Upper Plains are also under blizzard alerts. Roads are going to be really dangerous, potentially life-threatening. Minnesota, Minnesota State Police are advising people not to travel unless it's absolutely 
essential. Major airlines waiving change fees for people flying into several airports where the storms are hitting. We have NBC's Bill Karen standing by for the forecast. But first, NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is on the ground in Minneapolis. Gabe, uh, there's going to be two waves of snowfall. Get ready. This first one just started this afternoon. What are conditions like where you are on the ground right now? I see a lot of white stuff already. Well, yeah, that's right, Tom. Just a short time ago, the snow started falling here in that first wave that you mentioned. And also, Minnesota's governor has just issued emergency executive orders to prepare the National Guard here. And, Tom, I want to show you kind of what we thought we were going to see. You see that behind me, or rather, don't see that behind me? That's the Minneapolis skyline. It's barely visible right here. There are a few brave souls walking through this snow right here. The temperatures right now are in the Teens, but with a wind chill, it feels like it's going to be in the single digits. And as you said, this is just the first wave of snow. We expect this, and I'll let Bill Karens get into the details, but we expect this to continue throughout the overnight hours, then a lull tomorrow morning, but then tomorrow afternoon, that is when we are really expecting mm. the real, <laughs> the harsh snow to kick in. And as you said, it could be up around two feet of snow in some parts of Minnesota, Tom. Uh, can I now file a complaint on behalf of all school kids in Minnesota? You're supposed to get a school day, or, or a snow day, I should say, right? You should not have to go to school when it's this kind of snow, and yet they're going to e-learning. The kids still have to show up virtually in class. You know, Tom, it's a sign of the times. You know, at post-COVID, things have changed. The rite of passage, the you know school day back back in the day. Now they're yeah. doing uh, e-learning. But but Tom, you know, there's many preparations on the way right now. There's people stocking up. Um, yeah, but you know, people in Minnesota, they're used to this. But as you said, this is a potentially devastating storm. Could be the largest snowfall that they've had in more than a decade at this point. Again, it's not just Minnesota. Of course, we've already seen you know impacts in. The Dakotas, Colorado, affected by this weather system. And, you know, we're also seeing, um, you know, tens of millions of people right now really across the country under winter weather alerts at this point, Tom. All right, Gabe, thank you very much. Just in, we're now seeing damage out of a New Jersey county or likely a tornado touchdown. It looks like something caught on fire and trees fell over there in New Jersey. There's the scene right there with wires sparking. Let's bring in meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, you know, Gabe is from Miami. He doesn't remember snow days. I do. But now we got a tornado here. Very rare. What do we know about the situation there in Jersey? And then we're going to get into the, the snowstorm. Yeah, it was about seven miles from the capital of Trenton, uh, near Princeton, New Jersey. And it was on radar, and then we saw the damage in the pictures. Look at the confirmations far from the National Weather Service. But it certainly looks like New Jersey has had a very rare February tornado. No reports of any injuries, no fatalities. And this will be the first tor February tornado in New Jersey since 1999. And the state of New Jersey has only had four February tornadoes in the state's recorded history. So let's talk about a rare event. And that's the kind of winter it's been in the east, just like wild. And you can see some obviously big trees down uh, on tree on cars. I've seen trees down on homes. You saw those power lines that were on fire there. So yeah, a cleanup uh, and the sun's about to set here in the east too. So let's get to our big storm that we're dealing with. This is massive in size and it's strong in intensity. Two things you don't want to combine. We saw the snow in Minneapolis just now with Gabe and we've got snow in areas of the west. We're going to see snow in areas that almost never get snow in California. Way down on the grapevine. Uh, the hills outside the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco are going to get snow on them. You're going to see some incredible pictures in the days ahead. But the really dangerous stuff is where we have all these blizzard warnings between Bismarck and Fargo down towards Sioux City, all of portions of Minnesota. Minneapolis is not under a blizzard warning as of now. That could change tomorrow, especially with those wind gusts coming on Thursday. Still looking for somewhere around a foot and a half of snow in the Twin Cities. Nothing to sneeze out in Rapid City. Even Salt Lake could get about 12 inches of snow out of this. And then the winds tonight. I mean, we could hit 70 mile per hour winds on the strip in Las Vegas. We're going to have high winds in Phoenix all the way through the south and a little bit here heading into the deep south. But look at these projected wind gusts. 71 in Vegas, 66 in Flagstaff. I mean, this will cause some power outages through the overnight. And Tom, as you've noticed, the warm air continues all through the east and tomorrow is going to be exceptionally warm once again. It's just a head scratcher of a, you know, people are turning their air conditioners on in the mid-Atlantic yeah. in mid-February.
Yeah, we're expecting 80 degrees here in Washington on Thursday. It's really strange. Bill, thanks very much. All right, now to Ohio, where the EPA today ordered Norfolk Southern to clean up its mess from that train derailment that sent toxic chemicals into the air east of Palestine, Ohio. That's East Palestine, Ohio. The EPA has also ordered the company to pay for all of it. That means paying for the EPA, all of its efforts, and whatever it's already spent, identify and clean up the contaminated soil, the water sources, and attend public public meetings. No more avoiding the public. If Norfolk Southern doesn't comply with this order, the EPA says it will force it to pay triple the cost. The order comes as the EPA administrator visited the area for the second time in just a week. Drinking tap water along with other government representatives to make the point that they say the water is in fact safe. We believe in science, so we don't feel like we're being your guinea pig. But we don't mind proving to you that we believe the water. Okay. Here's to Caroline. Appreciate that. Here's to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. That's good. Well, the resident right there did go on to say that seeing government officials drink the water and answer her questions did make her feel a bit better. NBC's Ron Allen joins me now from East Palestine, Ohio. Ron, how much is this trip by the EPA chief designed to gain back the trust of the people there? Well, frankly, Tom, I think this whole situation is about trust and lack of trust because for the last couple of weeks, officials have been saying that the air, water, the environment is safe, and still there are significant numbers of people who just don't believe that. And they'll see that test, and they just will have their doubts about it. A lot of people talk about the fact that there was a suggestion made to use bottled water after these officials said the water was safe. And they said that did that out of an abundance of caution, but it raised a lot of doubts in people's minds. So it's going to take time before trust comes back. And yes, that's part of why the EPA administrator is here. That's why Governor DeWine is here again. That's why Governor Shapiro was here again. Uh, so they're, they're trying to do everything they can to try and win back the community's trust. Yes. Hey, Ron, talk to us more about this EPA order. When is it going to affect? And does the EPA think it's tough enough right now? This is tough enough. <laughs> That's the very question I asked. Yes, is it tough enough? It goes into effect in 48 hours. It's unclear of the timing of how long this will take. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a massive job. Here's a bit more of what the EPA administrator had to say about it. Take a listen. This is an, an authority that has been granted to us by Congress. Uh, we're going to require that Norfolk Southern gives us a prescription for exactly how they're going to clean up this mess and how they're going to pay for it. It's sort of analogous to a consent decree where there is a lot of oversight from the federal government watching what this uh, company is doing. And the EPA can step in if the process isn't going to their liking and then bill Norfolk Southern, in this case, for the work. I can also tell you that the governors of Ohio and Pennsylvania, both at that press conference, said that they are looking at possible criminal proceedings, criminal action against the company. Uh, a lot of people in this town feel that something very criminal was done here and they want to see more than just essentially money, fines, that sort of thing. What they want to see, of course, most is their community the way it was two weeks ago. And that seems a very distant prospect. Tom. You know, you and I have covered a lot of environmental disasters and it's always about holding them accountable two years from now, five, ten years from now. Uh, and I guess that's what the EPA is saying that they will do. Ron, thank you. Ron Allen, who's on the ground for us. And the CEO of Norfolk Southern sat down for uh, his first interview since the derailment today. He tells CNBC's Morgan Brennan about how the company has been trying to manage the fallout since the accident. Take a listen. Since this occurred, every single day, I've asked myself, what, what could we have done better? What could we have done to prevent this? And, you know, Morgan, it's pretty clear that our safety culture and our investments in, in safety didn't prevent this accident. That sounds like a mea culpa. Morgan Brennan joins me now. Morgan, this interview happened before the EPA announced the cleanup order. Have you heard anything from the company since that order? 
Hi, Tom. It's good to see you. So, so here's the statement from Norfolk Southern on the heels of that EPA order that we got uh, after my interview with CEO Alan Shaw. They say, quote, we recognize that we have a responsibility and we have committed to doing what's right for the residents of East Palestine. We have been paying for the cleanup activities to date. We'll continue to do so. It's a pretty lengthy statement, as you can see right there on your screen, but basically that we are going to learn from this terrible accident and work with regulators and elected officials to improve railroad safety. Just to give some context to this, Tom, I did sit down. It was the first interview since that disastrous derailment uh, 19 days ago. First interview by the CEO. 30-minute interview. We covered many different topics, but this is one that continued to come up through the discussion uh, was this pledge to be committed to the community. The fact that Norfolk uh, Southern is involved in the testing process, it's involved in this remediation and cleanup process that, that is actively underway, uh, and that it has paid out six and a half million dollars so far to date in term for reimbursement for what they call inconvenience fees, other ways to support the community. What Shaw told me was a quote unquote down payment on a longer term investment uh, in the community in the wake of this environmental disaster. Morgan, where's he been? Why hasn't he been on the ground talking to people one on one? And did he say anything more about how this happened and how they're going to make it right other than put money into it? Uh, well, so money is obviously a part of it and all the cleanup efforts. He has been on the ground. Um, he was on the ground over the weekend. Uh, he came back into town today as well. Uh, and he was on the ground actually three days after this derailment happened. Uh, they the decision was made between Norfolk Southern the governor of Pennsylvania, the governor of Ohio, since East Palestine sits right on, on the border of these two states, uh, and other officials and experts to do this controlled release of these toxic chemicals. He was on the ground for that process a, a, as well. Um, there's still, it's still very much an evolving situation, and I think a lot of the answers, or at least near-term answers and, and way this will play out uh, in the coming weeks will hinge on that NTSB review that's currently underway uh, that we are expecting at the beginning of next month that's going to have more detail about what caused this derailment and thus what that means in terms of the response moving forward. Yeah, I should have said, why hasn't he been talking to residents on the ground? You're right, he has been there. But uh, Morgan, thank you very much. Morgan Brennan, good interview. Thank you so much for bringing it to us. Coming up, Alec Murdoch's defense team is making its case in his double murder trial today. What Murdoch's surviving son is saying about his father's behavior in the moments after the murders. That's next. Plus, a Virginia elementary school is making headlines again. Just a month after a teacher was shot and injured by a six-year-old, we've got more details coming up. Kind of hard to believe. That's in the five things. Stay with us. We're back. Alec Murdoch was, quote, destroyed by the double murder of his wife and son back in June of 2021. That's according to testimony we heard today from his only surviving son, Buster. Buster Murdoch on the stand talked about the hours after the murders, telling jurors his dad was crying and could not really even speak to him. Here's just a piece of his testimony. What kind of condition was he in? What was his demeanor? Yeah, his demeanor was, I mean, he was destroyed. He was heartbroken. I walked in the door and saw him and um, gave him a hug and just, just broken down. Buster was the defense's third witness as the lawyers there tried to humanize Alec, insisting he's a family man who would never hurt his wife and son, we are now week five of this trial, one that practically everybody seems to know about at this point. The prosecution rested its case last week, and the defense expects to wrap it all up by Friday. NBC's Katie Beck has been following the trial, which just wrapped up for the day. Katie, beyond the murders, Buster's testimony also brought up the family's troubled finances, a fatal boat crash that Paul Murdoch was involved in, and then Alex pill use. Really, a lot of drama involving one family even before the murders. Absolutely, Tom. Lots of complex issues. And as you said, I think the goal for the defense in using Buster Murdoch, the only surviving son, would have been to humanize Alec, to talk about what a good father he was, what a good relationship they had, perhaps how he could have never imagined his father being capable of doing this. We didn't hear that from the stand today. Uh, Buster was sort of a stoic witness. We didn't see tears. We didn't really see much emotion other than uh, the sound that you just heard of him describing his father in the wake of these murders. 
What they used Buster for was more strategic and factual, uh, poking holes in some of the things that the prosecution pointed out as questionable. Things like whether Alec Murdoch changed his clothes that night. Buster pointing out it was perfectly normal for his father to come off of this property sweaty in the month of June and take a shower and change his clothes. Another thing brought up were the weapons. Were they left around this property loaded? His answer, yes. A lot of times weapons didn't make the, their way back to the gun room. That was sort of standard operating procedure. So using Buster as sort of a day in, day out witness of what did you see, uh, what can you testify to in terms of what was normal and what was not normal. Uh, the defense also called a forensics engineer uh, who I guess they hired to analyze the scene of Maggie and, and Paul's deaths, right? That's right. That engineer was talking most specifically about the trajectory of the bullets and the upward angle of these bullets, basically suggesting that someone who was as tall as Alec Murdoch could not have possibly fired the, the, the shot that killed Paul. Here's what he had to say on the stand about that. Could you say to a degree of engineering, certainly more probably than not, that Alec Murdoch on the night of June 7th did not fire that shot into the quail pen? In my opinion, it's, it's very unlikely that he fired that shot. So this theory has been floated out there before by the defense when they were cross-examining some prosecution witnesses, talking about the fact that this angle was very low and it would have been really difficult for a person to hold a gun at that angle and fire it at that trajectory. To be clear, that's a defense witness, uh, and there was an interesting cross-examination with the prosecution as well. Yeah, it got a little heated in there towards the end. They were definitely questioning his credibility as an expert witness and questioning his general knowledge of firearms. Uh, it went on for quite an extensive period of time. There were there were times it was so uncomfortable you sort of wanted to look away and felt a little little bad for the witness. Um, the judge sort of tried to stop some of it as, as the defense objected and called it badgering the witness. Uh, but it went on for a good portion of the afternoon, just sort of attacking some of his theories, attacking some of his justifications uh, for thinking in certain ways and definitely zeroing in on the fact that this is an engineer that normally focuses on accident recreations and doesn't have a whole lot of expertise when it comes to weapons or crime scenes. Tom. Oh, interesting. All right, Katie, thank you very much. Katie Beck. Let's get you over now to the five things that our team thinks you should probably know about tonight. Number one, recovery teams say at least eight people are dead, nearly 500 injured after that powerful aftershock hit Syria and Turkey. The latest quake of magnitude 6.3 was felt as far away as Egypt and Lebanon. The continued aftershocks are complicating the already difficult recovery efforts following that massive February 6th earthquake. 44,000 people have been killed. Number two, a month after a six-year-old was shot and injured, a six-year-old shot and injured a teacher at a Virginia elementary school, a fifth grader has now been removed from the same school for threatening to, quote, pop some bullets the threat was allegedly made in a group text between several students. The school district says police are investigating. Number three, the maker of Infomil plant-based infant formula is recalling 145,000 cans because of a possible bacterial contamination. The recalled batches were sold at stores across the U.S. and have a use-by date of March 1st, 2024. The company says it's acting out of an abundance of caution and no actual illnesses have yet been reported. Number four, you might want to rethink that romantic gondola ride if you're going to Venice, Italy. Look at that. The city's famous canals are running dry after weeks without rain. It's the opposite of the usual problem in Venice, flooded streets resulting from rising sea levels. But this year, the Alps got less than half their normal amount of snowfall, drying up the waterways across Italy. Number five, Home Depot says it's going to spend a billion dollars to raise wages for its hourly employees. The average starting salary will now be $15 an hour. It comes as retailers nationwide compete for workers in this very tight jobs market. Meanwhile, Home Depot stock, as we saw, er, said earlier today, it fell today after it missed Wall Street's revenue expectations. When we come back, a new candidate in California's Senate race could make history if elected. But there's one issue that could loom large over her campaign. Now she's trying to get ahead of questions about her age, coming up next.
We're back. A new candidate is jumping into the California Senate race today as Congresswoman Barbara Lee has officially announced her run for departing Senator Dianne Feinstein's seat. Now, Feinstein's age, you may recall, had been an issue before she announced her retirement. She's 89. Barbara Lee is 76. She's trying to get ahead of claims that she is also too old for the job. And for those who say my time has passed, well, when does making change go out of style? Right now, there are no black women in the United States Senate. If elected, Lee would become just the third in history. She joins Congresswoman Katie Porter and Congressman Adam Schiff in the race, which is already shaping up to be one of the most expensive in 2024. NBC's Ali Vitale joins me now from Capitol Hill. Ali, we haven't mentioned one major figure here, Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. The queen of California politics, she moved quickly to endorse Schiff. So what does that mean for Lee's hopes to gain ground in this race? Look, that's going to be a point of a little bit of awkwardness, a little bit of tension, especially when you consider the role that Pelosi has played in California politics. You're right that she's sort of the queen of that delegation and of that state, in part because she served for so long, not just as speaker here, but as a key fundraiser in California politics. I mean, I can pull up for you on the screen sort of like the pull of Pelosi, and it's things like raising over a billion dollars for Democrats, having rarely weighed in on Dem v. Dem races. The fact that she's coming in for shift here, not entirely surprising for people who follow who her allies are here in Congress. Schiff is someone who, when he was thinking about po possibly running for speaker or leadership, the thinking was that Pelosi was behind him there. So it makes sense that she's with him now for this Senate race. But she's also endorsed Katie Porter and Barbara Lee both in their past House races. And at least mm. when it comes to Barbara Lee, they've served together in the House for a long time. So there's an existing relationship there, too. Yeah, and Schiff was on the January 6th committee. You know, exactly. you, you heard Congresswoman Lee a moment ago basically saying age doesn't matter, and the president is 80 after all. Uh, if you're helping yeah. make change, though, how much of an obstacle do you think her age might be right now? Look, you look at the argument that she's making, and it's one that I think is important for many people who watch the Senate. The idea that there is not a black woman serving in that body right now, especially when you look at the coalition of Democrats that they've built over the midterms, and of course, in electing Joe Biden to office, black voters have been so key and integral, especially black women, in mobilizing at the grassroots level. When Barbara Lee talks about making change and it never goes out of style, simply her being there. Having a more reflective Senate is something that I think is going to speak to many voters, especially when you consider the fact that if Feinstein weren't serving out her full term, which of course right now, Tom, she says she's retiring in 2024 and is going to finish it out. But if for some reason she didn't, there's already a promise on the table from the governor there that he would appoint a black woman. There is a nod in this state to the fact that they know they had a black woman in the Senate before in Kamala Harris, and that that's something that's important to voters there as they consider a more reflective Reflective Senate, Lee could try to capitalize on that. You have always got good intel. Ali, thank you very much. <laughs> Ali Vitale on Capitol Hill. Coming up, we're hearing from people representing the kids who federal investigators say were hired to clean slaughterhouses. This will make you angry. It's an update on a story that we told you about last week. Plus, new video showing a moose charging a woman in Alaska. Don't mess with the moose, is the moral of the story. Coming up in the local. Now to an NBC News investigation, a Labor Department probe found child workers were hired by a company to clean slaughterhouses in Nebraska. Slaughterhouses. Federal investigators say the company, PSSI, employed more than 100 children at 13 facilities in eight states. We brought you the story on Friday when the Labor Department said it fined the company. Our Julia Ainsley reported those details right here. She went on to the town at the center of this investigation in Nebraska and spoke to somebody who has met and talked to the children involved. Watch this. Do you think these children knew what they were getting into with this job? I'm not sure anybody knows what they're getting into when they sign up to work at a meatpacking plant. It is dangerous machinery. It is greasy. It is smelly. There, there's blood uh, all over the factory. So I'm not sure the children could have really known what they were signing up for. 
NBC's Julie Ainsley is our NBC News Homeland Security correspondent. She joins me now to remind the audience these kids are 13 and up. 13, 13 to 17, right? yeah. Uh, and some of them are undocumented uh, aliens, right? Or undocumented yeah, most, immigrants. Most are. And in fact, that's what Audrey Lutz, who we spoke to in Grand Island, Nebraska, explained that these are often undocumented kids who are here not knowing their legal rights. And maybe they could be authorized to work in the countries they come from. She spoke to a lot from Guatemala. But here in the U.S., they might not understand what they're getting into. And this can be an incredibly dangerous job. Oh, yeah. In fact, there have been adults who have been cleaning the same equipment equipment and have died from decapitations. I mean, oh. Incredibly gruesome, grim job. And on top of that, these children are working at night and then going to school during the day. Some of the school officials telling the investigators they saw them falling asleep in class. How does this happen in 2023? I'm sorry, it's hard to fathom this is happening today. Well, I think that's the outrage we've seen about this story. I mean, even when we started just reporting the bits that we were gathering from the investigation, there's been so much interest in the story because of that. Now, we went to the company, of yep. course, to give them a chance to respond. And they say these are rogue individuals who came in with false IDs. Wait but, a minute. The kids are rogue individuals? Right. That it's not part of some conspiracy. Look, they came in with an ID saying they were older than they were. How could we know it's a false identification? But speaking to Audrey, who's met firsthand with these children, she says... It's really hard to mistake an 18 year, a 13 year old for an 18 year old. Of course. Uh, so anyway, we've got more on this tonight on NBC Nightly News. We've spoken to former employees who have a well-documented history of how this happened inside the company and how many supervisors turned a blind eye. Just staggering. Julia, thank you for being on the story. Again, Julie's reporting tonight on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, 630 Eastern Time. Uh, NBC covers hundreds of stories every single day, and you can't possibly read, watch, or listen to all of them. So our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. This is what they tell us is going on in their regions. It's a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, fire authorities in Oakwood Village, Ohio, say they don't know what caused a deadly explosion at a metal manufacturing plant yesterday. At least one worker was killed. A dozen others were hurt. Some had severe burns. From our Southeast Bureau, there is a special election in Virginia today. Voters are filling the seat held by the late Congressman Donald McKeech. Uh, who died last year. Democrat Jennifer McClellan is, try, McClellan, pardon me, is facing Republican Leon Benjamin. If McClellan wins, she'll be the first black woman to represent Virginia in Congress. From our Western Bureau, check this out. Video capturing the moment a moose charged a woman while she was walking her dog. It kicked her. She has staples in her head and some bruising. The woman told our affiliate in Anchorage that she walks that route with her pup all the time. There's the moose. Beware of the moose. Still to come, Congressman George Santos admits he's a bad liar while doubling down on some questionable statements. What he's saying in a new interview coming up next. Here we go. Controversial Congressman George Santos, who's accused of telling one lie after another, now admits he's, quote, a terrible liar. Now, he, t he tells Piers Morgan in a new interview he only fabricated parts of his biography in order to fit in. I've been a terrible liar on, okay. the, on those subjects. It wasn't about tricking the people. This was about getting accepted by the party. Mm-hmm. All right, just in case you need a reminder, Santos has lied about a lot, including his family's, his family's Jewish heritage, playing volleyball at a college he never attended, working at several Wall Street firms, and even where his mom was on 9-11. NBC Sahil Kapoor follows, is uh, joining me now and is following all of this. Santos is admitting to being a liar here, but he's still not backing down on claims already debunked by several media organizations, right? So what's, what's the strategy here? It's like he can't help himself. Well, Tom, George Santos' strategy seems to be to ride this out for as long as he possibly can, to simply refuse to go away until he is forced to. This is uh, abundantly clear at this point that this is a congressman who is not going to be shamed into quitting. There are others in his position who might be, but uh, based on everything we've seen, based on how he's responded to these litany of lies and fabrications uh, and falsehoods that he's told come out, it looks like he's waiting to be pushed. And so far, that has not happened. Now, Santos has benefited 
benefiting from two different dynamics here. The first is Republicans control a very narrow majority in the House of Representatives. So, Hill, I think we lost your signal there, unfortunately. Uh, but let me just hopefully we can toss to a sound by. Wait, you're back. So, Hill, are you there? I am here if you can hear me now. All right, yes. Pick it up where you were and toss to the soundbite with George Santos. The uh, first dynamic, Tom, that Santos benefits from is that it's a narrow House majority. They don't want to lose his vote. And the second is he sits in a swing district that President Biden carried in 2020. If he steps aside, then that district could flip back to a Democrat. And that seems to be a gamble that Speaker Kevin McCarthy doesn't want to take. Finally, Tom, I think Santos may be selling himself a little bit short on one thing. He's not as terrible a liar as he makes himself out to be. This man <laughs> ran twice in two successive cycles. Got all this stuff passed a litany of voters uh, who didn't catch him until he was after he was until after he was elected. This man is a talented liar. <laughs> well, he just he just seems to relish the attention. Uh, that seems to be what's going on here because he doesn't seem to have a whole lot of shame. He's not stepping down, uh, and House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy still isn't looking to kick him out of Congress for the reasons you already articulated. But he's under a House ethics investigation, possible criminal investigations as as well, right? So how long will he play this out? Well, look, there's no timeline for these investigations. How that House ethics can take weeks, sometimes months. These uh, various federal investigations could also take a long time. And even if he does get indicted, uh, then that becomes a political question of, of whether, you know, he's going to step aside or whether he's going to fight the charges. So all roads here lead back to Speaker Kevin McCarthy. And as I just mentioned, yeah. he's reluctant to push him out, Tom. I hate to say it, but it's good fodder for uh, conversations like this and with late night comedians. Uh, Sahil, thank you very much. That is a wrap at this hour. We're going to have much more for you here tomorrow, same time, same channel, and the coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.